um, reading these texts and the sense of the sense I got was that the ancient Egyptians had devoted their best minds for more than 3,000 years to considering the mystery of life. What is it that we're here for? What happens to us when we die? And in the ancient Egyptian texts, we are presented as being part of a, a vast celestial macrocosm with many different layers and we're at one level of it undergoing experiences learning and growing and developing but there are levels beyond this and we can access those levels through the life that we lead on this earth and and through the choices that we make um, and it comes very clear it also is interestingly clear in the tibetan book of the dead too that we have been given a precious gift to be souls incarnated in human bodies and that not a second of that gift should be wa wasted and that we should never imagine, we should never buy into the illusion that this is all there is. There is so much beyond this. It's, very, it's a very powerful illusion that there is only matter, the material world, and there is nothing else, but it is an illusion. I'm sure of that. And, and that our, our, true, our true home and destiny is, is far beyond this and that we choose to manifest on this plane because there are lessons that we learn here. But to learn those lessons properly, we have to forget that we chose to manifest here. We have to come into it completely raw and fresh every time. Because if you did remember the previous lessons, you wouldn't learn the new ones. You'd know the game. We, that's how I think it, kind of think it works. The Greeks used to say that on reincarnation, you had to drink the waters of forgetfulness in order to come back into life and live and live again. And maybe life reshuffles the cards many ways and puts us in many different life experiences through which we grow. And define ourselves by our choices. So I found myself gradually, although it wasn't Christianity, it wasn't the Christianity that I'd rebelled against in my, in my parents, well, I found myself gradually uh, being drawn into a spiritual way of thinking. Um, these Egyptian texts really had a profound effect on me. And not only those, there's intriguing material in the Popol Vuh, for example, the Mayan texts and, and other ancient texts. And I, I realized that I couldn't possibly, it would be trivializing this amazing body of material if I were simply to concentrate on the technological aspects. There are many technological mysteries. It is, it is fascinating really what the ancients could achieve and how they could achieve it. As, as I said in my, my main talk, I don't think we need a, ancient astronauts to explain what was done in the, in the ancient world. I'm not saying there weren't ancient astronauts, but I don't think we need them to explain the archaeological sites. And there are many intriguing issues very simply how did they build the great pyramid how did they get 70 ton blocks 300 feet in the air <clears throat> and so on and so forth which are fascinating what about those high-speed drills that we find the drill cores for all over the Giza plateau where they were hollowing out granite with drills that were turning at the rate of very fast modern industrial drills with high precision bearing down on the granite with massive weight when the ancient Egyptians are only supposed to have had copper it kind of didn't make sense and I'm very interested in all of those technological aspects but I couldn't simply do that and write a book you know saying there was advanced technology in the past without paying tribute to and involving myself deeply in the profound spirituality uh, of the ancients and and that is I think the time when spirituality started to come back into my life and and it did so more and more uh, as the as the years went by uh, after Fingerprints of the Gods, I had the privilege of working with Robert Boval. Where are you, Rob? We have the great Robert Boval here. Please stand up, Rob. Here's Rob. Rob and I, Rob and I have been in the trenches together so many times with the bullets flying over our heads. You know, it's been a, it's been a quite a journey these last uh, 23 years. That's how, how long I've known Rob. We met in 1993. Uh, and we wrote together in 1996 um, the book that was called The Message of the Sphinx in the UK, in, in the US, and Keeper of Genesis in the UK. Now, Robert, of course, as we all know, uh, has made what I regard, and I've said this many times, as the fundamental breakthrough in accessing the truth about ancient Egypt. And that fundamental breakthrough is the Orion correlation. This is a a discovery of genius and not just the discovery but then the the
presentation of that discovery, the meticulous, detailed work done to support it, the connection to the ancient Egyptian texts, everything that just absolutely proves, no matter how much the academics don't want it to be so, it just proves that this cannot be a coincidence. This cannot be a coincidence. We are dealing with a sky ground system, which gives us an insight, a key into the whole thinking of that amazing culture and into the remote past of that amazing culture because the ancient Egyptians didn't believe that they just came out of nowhere. They saw themselves as the inheritors of the legacy of the gods and as those who were implementing the program of the gods upon earth. So I began to realize that there was just much more going on than I'd ever imagined. And, and uh, the Orion correlation, Robert's work had a huge effect on me and I, I reported that also in, in, in Fingerprints of the Gods, and then we went on together to write, uh, uh, to, to, to write The Message of the Sphinx, where it turns out that the, it's not only the Orion correlation. At the same moment that you get the perfect sky ground lock with, uh, with Orion's belt and the pyramids, you also get the constellation of Leo rising in the east, housing the sun in line with the gaze of the Sphinx. And even the Milky Way and the River Nile are in the right place. And it's just, it's just like, my God, this is the key. We're, we're opening up a place that's been hidden for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so I go on from there. Um, I suffered, uh, I won't say I suffered, it comes with the territory. Um, because my book was successful, I became the focus, not I alone, but Rob came in for a lot of shit as well. And both of us collectively came in for it. Rob and I had to fight a battle against the BBC when they misrepresented our work. But uh, uh, I came in for a lot of hostility and, and, and negative reactions from academics. And what this made me realize is, first of all, expect that, because academics actually treat each other that way too. They're like ferocious packs of attack dogs all the time. I sometimes wonder, actually, what it would be like if the scientific method worked differently. What, you see, the scientific method works like this at the moment. Here's an idea. Let's find every way we can to destroy it. Let's find anything in it that's bad, and let's multiply that until nobody can listen to this idea at all. That's how science reacts to every new idea. The theory is that through this fire of so-called peer review, only the good ideas will get through, and the bad ideas will be discarded. I don't think that's true. I think it would be interesting if science took a different position altogether, and actually instead of looking for what's wrong with an idea, if they started looking for what's right with an idea. Let's see what a value we can extract from this notion, rather than just rub it out and, and throw, it, throw it away. Anyway, the, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the critical onslaught made me up my game. Uh, you, you don't want to leave loopholes for these buggers to get in and give you trouble. You know, the, 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 they will multiply that, they will elaborate that loophole, they will expand it until it seems to taint your whole work, even though it actually doesn't. So I, I determined, I wrote, a, I then spent six or seven years scuba diving all over the world, looking at underwater ruins to write a book called Underworld, which has more than 2,000 footnotes. Why? Because I'm trying to bulletproof my argument. I'm trying to anticipate where the attacks are going to come from and put the shield up to stop them, stop them doing that. Well, that's, that makes it a more rigorous academic work, but also, I'm afraid to say, makes it a very boring read and a bit of a boring write as well, actually. Um, this constant bully, bulletproofing of arguments. And I, I, you know, what I've tried to do, I still think it's important. I believe, I know Rob feels the same way and many others in this field, there's a real task ahead. And, that, and I, I think it's important that we get to the truth about our past. I think it's important that history gets rewritten. But history is not going to get rewritten with weak, bad and unsupported ideas. However much we may miss, wish them to be true, if we cannot underline them and support them thoroughly and solidly, they are going to end up on the ash can of history. And we must not let that happen. So, so I, I feel very strongly that it's important to be rigorous in the way that we do this work. But I try these days to be rigorous, but not boring. Somehow, you know, I'm not writing academic books for, I'm not writing textbooks. These are books for the general public. And, and I've, I hope I've found a way to balance the two, the two requirements. So I continue a little bit longer on the issue of spirituality. Um, through the 90s, I publish Underworld in 2002. And then frankly, I feel in a way that I'm done 
with the lost civilization story. I've just spent six and a half years doing thousands of dives in some of the most difficult diving conditions in the world. And, and I think, you know, I have actually walked the walk. And uh, I've said what I've got to say. And I, I'm, I'm going to move on now. And maybe, hopefully, other people will come along and pick up this mantle and, and, and take the story of the lost civilization forward. I, I, I think I'd, I'd taken a lot of pain from various of the attacks. The whole thing we had with the BBC was really a nightmare. And, and um, I just wanted out. So I thought I'm going to do something different. And I'd always been interested in the mystery of human origins. So I thought I'd look into that. And I started doing the background research. I thought there was something must be exciting there, missing link or something. But then I discovered that the, really the, most of the story from the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee to us is just incredibly boring. It's really dull. I call it, as I said the other day, six, six million years of boredom. Um, and... and uh, uh, then suddenly, just about after 100,000 years ago, and really strongly around 40,000 years ago, all around the world, you get this amazing outburst of incredible symbolic art. It's, it's just, it's stunningly beautiful. I mean, Picasso goes into Lascaux Cave in 1947. He comes out to the waiting reporters. He's dazed. He's stunned. They ask him, what, what do you make of this art? He said, we today, as artists, we have invented nothing. They were doing it all tens of thousands of years ago. The art of the painted caves is, is amazing. And I, that's when I read, that's where the issue is, I realized. What was it that caused this spark? Why did we, why were we so boring, so dull, even after we become anatomically modern for so long, and then suddenly we wake up in this incredible way and we're, we're making these huge underground cathedrals. It is, um, I think a privilege to look at rock and cave art uh, anywhere in the world. And there's amazing petroglyphs around this area, around Joshua Tree, which my friends Robin and Max have, have taken me to see. Um, but uh, there's something special about entering a deep cave, deep underground. In some cases, you must walk four kilometers underground before you come to the painted cave. Um, and, and you find yourself in the depths of mountains confronted by really spooky, strange, wonderful, wonderful art. So the question is, what led our ancestors to do this? What caused the change? And um, I came across the work of a South African ac academic called David Lewis Williams, who teaches at the University of Witwatersrand. And I discovered that he, for more than 20 years then, had been advocating and putting forward a theory which he calls the neuropsychological theory of cave art. Um, and initially, he had been very much an outsider. But as the years went by, his case became stronger and stronger. And by the time I got into this research, his case is really the mainstream understanding of what cave art is. And uh, it's one of the very few times in my history that I found myself in complete agreement with a mainstream academic. Because what David Lewis Williams is saying is, that these commonalities, these similarities that we see in rock and cave art all around the world actually can be very simply explained. The artists had experienced deeply altered states of consciousness. They may have experienced those as a result of psychedelic plants or fungi. They may have experienced them through fasting. They may have received, experienced them through meditation, through rhythmic dancing. There's a lot of ways to get us to detach from the lock to the material realm. Nature provides us with a host of remedies in order to do this. It happens today, some may find this controversial, um, but believe me, I've done the studies. Amongst shamanistic cultures, the most usual way of entering a deeply altered state is with psychedelic and visionary plants. But it's not the only way, by any means. It's not, it's not required. Um, the altered state of consciousness results in certain universalities, certain visionary experiences occur. And it's those visionary experiences that are being set down on the walls of the painted caves. Um, and and uh, you, we very quickly learn that the old ideas are not correct. Uh, for example, for a long time it was taught that the images were about hunting magic. Because that's us, we're projecting our view of the past on the past. We think they were simple primitives. So we say, oh, hunting magic. They wanted to capture the soul of the animal so they depicted it pierced. Well, this turns out this is not correct. Uh, of all the painted figures in Europe, there are only 2% that have, are, are pierced in any way. 
Uh, and there's no relationship between the animals painted on the cave walls and the animals that were eaten around the caves. For example, at Lascaux, the main consumption item was reindeer. But inside Lascaux, there's only a single image of a reindeer, and it has the feet of a duck. Um, some other explanation was needed, and the, the visionary explanation, I, I, I gave the detailed account of this in my workshop, so I won't do it here, but the visionary, the visionary explanation impressed me enormously as, as, as profoundly true. Now, of course, I went and interviewed David Lewis Williams, and I, I said, have you ever taken any psychedelics yourself? And he said, no. Um, no. I don't want to fry my brain. <laughs> And, and I said, but you're arguing that psychedelics were a major influence in the outburst, uh, emergence of cave art and this transformation of modern human behavior. Don't you feel you should have those experiences? He said, well, I get migraines and I get the flashing lights and that's enough for me. Uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, I, 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 he said, the other point was, I don't need to do that because I have all the research and the research settles the matter anyway. Um, there was uh, another... Uh, Egyptologist, not Egyptologist, archaeologist at the time called Paul Barn, who was a great expert in Stone Age art. And he strongly opposed David Lewis Williams' theory. Uh, and he argued that actually psychedelic mushrooms, but psilocybin mushrooms, did not appear in Europe until after contact with the Americas. This was the argument of Paul Barn. And of course, if the argument were true, it would be a killer argument against David Lewis Williams' theory, because, which is profoundly based on the use of psilocybin in uh, ancient Europe. So I decided I had to investigate this. And I got hold of a, a, a mycologist from the University of Edinburgh, and I asked him to do DNA tests on psilocybe semilanciata from America and on psilocybe sem semilanciata from Europe. And those DNA tests confirmed absolutely that these two psilocybe semilanciatas have been evolving separately for tens of thousands of years. In other words, of course the mushrooms were present in Europe uh, at the time the caves were, were painted. I've always believed as a researcher that it is not appropriate for me simply to sit in an armchair. I must get out in the field. I must, my, I must put myself into my story. I must experience what I'm talking about. Um, and what I was talking about was the induction, deliberate induction of deeply altered states of consciousness by shamans, which afterwards, when they returned to the normal alert problem-solving state of consciousness, which afterwards led them to remember and paint their visions. And then I discovered that in the Amazon rainforest, there are to this day tribes who drink the powerful psychedelic brew ayahuasca, and afterwards, when they've come back to themselves, they paint their visions, just like was being suggested in the Stone Age. And then when I started looking at the paintings, like particularly the paintings of Pablo Amaringo, they have a lot in common with the Stone Age art. So I suddenly realized, this is something I have to do. I had only taken one psychedelic before, and that was in 1974. I was 23, 24 years old. It was at the Windsor free festival in 1974 in England, uh, I believe was the true end of the 1960s. And um, I went to that festival with two friends. I didn't know anything much about LSD at that time. I'd smoked a bit of pot, but I didn't know. And we were offered this tab of LSD. And, and we decided that we would slice it into three slivers and we would have one sliver each. And uh, I didn't know what to expect. I, I had my sliver. Um, and uh, pretty soon I felt like walking. I didn't want to stay in the tent. Uh, I wanted to walk around, and so I left my two friends there, and I, and I walked for 12 hours. That's when I discovered why it's called a trip. Um, <laughs> and, and I have to say, I had the most amazing experience that I've ever had in my life. It was so joyous, it was such an adventure. Um, I, uh, this is a huge festival. Uh, there's thousands and thousands of people there, there's campfires burning, and I'm walking amongst them and the long hair and the beads, and I suddenly feel that I've been transported back in time, and that I'm in some kind of Viking encampment, and it all becomes very real to me, and I love it, and you know, because I, I always was interested in the Vikings anyway, and there I am, and then I find myself in a field of flowers, and 
I'm, I, I start doing Aikido movements, I've forgotten them long ago, amongst the flowers, I'm just having a beautiful time. Then I, then I walk up to it, I see this huge tree on a hill, and I walk up there, and then I realize that the tree is possessed by a giant spider, and that the giant spider has cocooned, cocooned lots of people, and I see all these cocoons on the ground. Of course, there's people in sleeping bags. Um, <laughs> and there's no spider. But the fantasy was very exciting, and I... I had this journey around it. Uh, 12 hours later, it's, uh, I'm definitely coming down. Reality is there and not there at the same time, and I'm just feeling great. I go back to my, the, the, find out my way back to the tent, and my friend Peter, he's still in the tent. Uh, the other guy, Jeremy, has gone off somewhere, but Peter's still in the tent, and he's had a terrible night. They're just a dreadful night. So the, 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 uh, he's been convinced of the utter meaninglessness of life. And he's actually, he's actually deeply disturbed. And I say, well, Pete, come for a walk. Let's go for a walk. And we go for a walk. And, and then off in the distance, uh, in a field, I, I look over there and I see what I take to be a row of elves dancing like this. <laughs> and I say, Peter, are those, are those elves? And he said, uh, no, I think they're policemen. <laughs> and, <laughs> and sure enough, a huge cordon of police comes in and the truncheons come out and they smash up the whole Windsor Free Festival. And uh, I mean, we didn't get beaten up, but it was a kind of harsh ending to the experience. Afterwards, I thought, if I, I, real, I took in mind what had happened to Peter and I thought, if I had a, an experience as powerful as that and it went the other way, I don't know what would happen to me. So I actually didn't take any more LSD or any more psychedelics for years and years and years. Right through until 2003, when I began to research the book that would become Supernatural, when I realized I needed to go to the Amazon and drink ayahuasca. Now, again, let me state clearly, I do not believe that psychedelic and visionary plants are necessary for all in this kind of encounter. But some of us need the help of our plant allies. Let's remember, we are part of a natural universe. The plants that grow on this planet are as natural and as pure as anything that we can imagine. And they are here to offer help to those of us who need it. Many of us are spontaneous visionaries. Many of us can enter other realms without any help from the plants, or perhaps they need meditation or fasting, other techniques. But for those who, through conditioning and circumstances of life, are quite locked into the material frame, the plants offer a suddenly expanded universe. You suddenly realize that things are very different from how you saw them before. Uh, and you find it difficult to convince yourself that the visionary experiences you are having are just your brain on drugs. You realize that you are, you are perceiving realities that you did not perceive before. At least that's how I read it. And my experiences with ayahuasca, initially in the Amazon jungle, 11 experiences there, one before that actually in Belgium, and then 11 experiences in the Amazon, enabled me to authentically write my book, Supernatural, but they did something else as well. They changed my life completely. I, what began as a research project afterwards became a kind of personal work. Um, I, I felt that I had, <laughs> I had become so arrogant in a way in the 1990s. I, I realize now. Ar arrogance is a terrible mistake. Um, and and uh, there was a lot about me that wasn't right at all. And... and uh, Ayahuasca showed me this just with absolute clarity. You know, you are not the beautiful, nurturing, loving person you think you are. You're actually quite toxic. You're hurting other people. You know, this is you. Yeah? Deal with it. Yeah, well, DMT is the active ingredient of ayahuasca. Uh, Those would be very new clinical trials. I know they've used psilocybin. Yeah, it'd be, be interesting. it'd be interesting to know whether DMT in the pure and injected form, you, you can take, you, there's, two, there's a number of ways to take DMT. The way, I'm diverging slightly, but I'll come back to my point. The, a number of ways to take DMT. Uh, first of all, remember it's a natural brain hormone. We all have DMT in our bodies, but usually in sub-psychedelic quantities. Uh, the mo most common way that DMT is taken is to smoke it. Uh, in, in a, a sort of vape pipe. 
Um, with uh, Smoked DMT, the other way, by the way, is the way that Rick Strassman did at the University of New Mexico, where the DMT is given as an intravenous infusion, uh, goes straight into the bloodstream. Um, well, as I've said many times, whether smoked or as an intravenous infusion, when you hit the dose, DMT is an uncompromising rocket ship to the other side of reality. Yeah. You've injected LSD. Wow. I bet it was something. Do we all know that Aldous Huxley on his deathbed received a massive dose of LSD? Yes, his wife gave it to him. It was his wish. Yeah. I apologize for interjecting at this moment, no, 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 but it fine. seems this That's what topic. We're here for. Okay, um, I do make the programs for Houston Ions Institute of Noetic Sciences. Sorry, I'm not hearing you quite clearly. Um, I make Houston the programs Ions. for the Houston Ions. We have a Which large was Ed community Mitchell's, group. Ed, Ed exactly, was, was exactly. The I've been making the programs for three years, but anyway, it's a, it's been in around for 15 years. Right. And we have over 400 people on our mailing list. Meetings every month, about 25 to. 30, 30 to 50 people, yeah. and we did have a talk by uh, PhD Mark Ryan on Aldous Huxley a year ago spring, right. and he did bring up exactly all the things you're yes. talking about in Aldous Huxley. However, Dr. Ryan did bring up that somewhere later in life, Aldous Huxley made the personal comment that if one can achieve their goals uh, through natural, more natural means without psychedelic drugs, it would be preferable. Sure, I, but, I agree. <laughs> yeah, but, I, 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 but, I, I but agree. he did take that dose. That's right, because he wanted to take the experience. Well, he it was yeah. very much connected to his beliefs in the afterlife and the right. Tibetan Book of the Dead and the Journey of Souls. He he, it was very important to him to to have LSD on his deathbed. He in, in fact insisted on it. Right. So it's a it's but the, but the point you're making is absolutely fair and right. Um, I, however, I want to address one thing when you say that. It's better if we do it by natural means. What could be more natural than a mushroom well, or a vine? Yeah, I understand. What could be more right. natural than that? Right. See, this is, you're, you're unknowingly buying into ideological language. Well, no, you're using well, the just, language of the war on drugs I'm, without actually knowing you're doing it because you come from a good place. Well, I appreciate that and yeah. I thank you for it. However, that was Mark Ryan's comment. Okay, it's not yours. Yeah, it, well, I've never taken drugs, but, okay. but I am very much with meditation. Yes. And I do feel... Personally, personally, I feel like if we have, if we live eternally, what's the rush? But, but, as you say, you know, people, some people need this and want this. Yes. And I do agree, I do personally agree that this is the best way to protect our children oh, is yeah. to legalize it's this, to legalize as you were talking it. about yeah. in your, yeah. in yeah. your we, workshop. We must, we must do that. It right, is, I understand that. Yeah. I do, I do. However, um, Meditation is much more gradual, and fasting. Now, these were all methods used by mystics through all the sure. ages, forever and ever. Sure. And uh, many of those persons also used, like like the mystics for, who wrote the Kabbalah mm -hmm. and all the other commentary, the Zohar, mm -hmm. and the mystics in Safed. They took they took they took substances, yeah. and they tranced and they you know moved and swayed I, I like to, the Sufis. If I may pause you for a moment, I don't mean to be I'm sorry hostile or antagonistic. The the only thing that that um, that I want to say is that uh, actually I've forgotten what I want to say. <laughs> too much, too much cannabis last night. Um, uh, s s sorry, who's asking me the question? Yes, you can snort it. Yes, yes. Yeah, you can snort it. Yeah, they blow it. Yopo, yopo, yopo snuff, which is a dimethyltryptamine snuff. Um, I, I'm beginning to lose my. To lose my track. Um, yeah, one thing I wanted to say, just addressing this this issue about the legalization of drugs, um, is that any of us who have a, a knee-jerk reaction against psychedelics, but have never taken psychedelics ourselves, are really not in a position to talk about that matter at all. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, I was, I was talking about the... Um, they're not in a position either to condemn or to advocate. If you have not had the experience, really avoid talking about it because it's just talk, talking uh, hot air. 
Um, the, the, um, the point I was making was about the mycology, the evidence that Psilocybe semilanciata uh, evolved separately in Europe and America for tens of thousands of years. Um, it was interesting to me that both Paul Barn, who, who was trying to make the argument that there were no psychedelic mushrooms in Europe prior to contact, and David Lewis Williams, who was making the argument that there was, that neither of them had ever taken psychedelics. So I felt that it was a bit like a couple of celibate monks having an argument about sex, you know. Uh, at any rate, whether frowned upon or not, I understand that we do have built-in negative reactions. Remember that if you have those negative, instant negative reactions towards the notion of psychedelics, that that is probably not, and unless you've had a psychedelic experience yourself, that's probably not coming from a place of authentic experience in your life. What that's actually coming from is 50 years of massively funded mind programming. And let us remember that the very people who created the war on drugs, which we've all been asked to buy into, are the worst human beings on our planet. People like Richard Nixon. The, 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 the true horrors. The war on drugs was not created to protect the public from drugs. That is utter bullshit. The war on drugs was created to give a license to the state to enter our consciousness and control the most intimate and the most sapient and the most personal part of ourselves. If we as adults cannot make sovereign decisions about our own consciousness, then we can't make sovereign decisions about anything. And, and, and freedom is meaningless. So this whole debate has been tainted by ideology for decades, and we need to come to an end. It's going to be reviewed 200 years from now as one of the historic mistakes that human civilization made, like burning people at the stake. Just a huge error called the war on drugs. I know this for sure, but it'll take time, and we're in the midst of it. I love the fact that America, the American people, see, in the global war on drugs, the American state has been the engine behind that, forcing other countries to buy into this persecution of free and independent adults who simply choose to explore their own consciousness. And at the same time, licensing criminal gangs to make billions of dollars selling vile addictive drugs. This is a, this is a, it can't be done except deliberately. It's a, it's, sorry? Well, let me carry on because although the American Although the American state, I know you did, by the way, uh, the, believe me, the British, the British are the masters of secrecy and control, the club, the cabal, it's all, it's all British shit, Def, defin, definitely, it's all British shit, but the point I wanted to make is that although the American state has been behind this dreadful, evil and wicked war on drugs, the American people are turning it back. It's the American people, one by one, who are turning it back. And, and I have seen things that I could never imagine occurring in Britain. You know, we have counties in Britain, like Yorkshire and Northumberland. I cannot imagine Yorkshire making cannabis legal if Westminster doesn't agree. But here in America, cannabis is totally legal in Colorado, totally legal in Oregon, totally legal in Alaska, totally legal in Washington state. 23 states available for medical use, as it rightly and properly should be. We have the right to make decisions about medicating our own bodies. That does not belong to the government. It doesn't belong to some fucking bureaucrat. It's our decision. Great. Great. Uh, believe me, I, I wish I lived in California. Um, so, but I'm talking drugs at the moment. Okay, I, as is probably well known, I developed um, an abusive relationship with cannabis over many years. Um, it became the central dominating focus in my life. I came to it very late in 1987, but boy, when I came to it, I came to it in a big way. Um, and and uh, initially I would only smoke evenings and weekends, and then I found that I liked to be stoned all day, and I could, I could write while I was stoned, and so I became a 16 hour a day, seven day a week pot, pot smoker, and, and um, I used to organize my life around where I could get access to pot. Um, and and uh, I became very suspicious and paranoid. I'm not saying that the, the cannabis did that to me. I'm saying it, maybe that's in me already and it somehow the overuse of it revealed that. I don't know. But I became a, I became a fairly toxic uh, partner to my wife, Santa. Uh, and we went down to Brazil because I continued with the ayahuasca work. 
We went down to Brazil in 2011 and I was just given the most tremendous kicking by Mother Ayahuasca, uh, totally focusing on my cannabis habit and the way that I was relating to it. Um, and uh, that stopped me dead in my tracks for, for three years. I never took any more cannabis at all. Um, it was it's just Joe Rogan's fault that I'm taking it again. Um, <laughs> because, because I'm on the show, I'm on Joe Rogan's show and we're sitting there live talking and and he says, so are you still giving up the cannabis? And I said, well, yeah, but I'm, I'm kind of thinking after three years I could dip my toes back in the water. And Joe says, well, why not start now? And pulls out a, <laughs> pulls out a nice beefy California joint, you know, and lights it up. And, and well, I'm not going to say no. So I smoked it with him. And, and uh, believe me, when you haven't smoked cannabis for three years, <laughs> whoa, the tolerance level goes way down. Somehow I held it together. I did listen back to the other, the last hour and a half of that interview, and I didn't lose my thread too often. Um, <laughs> amazingly, so but I'm still stunned when the interview is over, and I've driven there in a rental car, but I can't possibly drive. So I have to call Santa, who's out in the town somewhere with our daughter-in-law, and they come and rescue me, <laughs> and bring me, and bring me home. And then after that, I did a big journey across America with Santa and Randall Carlson. We were through Washington State and Oregon, and of course there's cannabis available. I had a little bit more, and I found I enjoyed it, but I didn't feel, I didn't feel that I needed to, to have it at the, at the obsessional center of my life in the way that I'd had before. Um, these days I very rarely smoke cannabis. I sometimes use a bit of cannabis oil, um, and I, I'm very determined that I won't write under the influence of cannabis. Partly, it's good actually for sparking ideas, but writing under it. The problem is that you, you know, you're, you're writing a paragraph and you just get it perfect and then you can change a little bit and oh, that thought needs to go in and suddenly you find that seven hours have passed and you've only written 20 words, you know, so it's not good. Um, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to, to Ayahuasca for, for giving me the lesson and for allowing me, as long as the, my behavior does not get bent out of shape again, uh, allowing me to p participate of the beautiful, sensual uh, healing plant called cannabis. Um, uh, so um, it was my ayahuasca experiences. I've had more than 60 sessions with ayahuasca now um, that, that um, really opened me up to, to the nature, to, to what I believe to be the mysterious nature of reality the multi-dimensional character of reality, the possibility of the existence of non-physical intelligences who, because I've met them and they've communicated with me. And either, you know, my brain on drugs is just so incredibly imaginative that I can actually create huge universes uh, or something weird is going on. Um, and particularly so since other people encounter the same entities I've met. And, and it's just, it's just, really, we talk about the paranormal, but one way if you're not a psychic, if you're not gifted in those in the mediumistic ways, one way one way to enter deep into into a completely other reality is is with a powerful visionary aid like uh, like like ayahuasca. Uh, it's not for everybody. I don't. I'm not here to advocate it any more than I would be here to advocate uh, climbing uh, a cliff or jumping out of an airplane. Uh, all of those things are by, by by the way allowed in our society. Um, it, it's an adventure. There is an element of risk element of danger. Uh, in, you're aware of that in taking ayahuasca. Um, some people have very tough times and very, very bad experiences. It's never all sweetness and light in that garden. There's, there's a lot of other issues too. But behind it, I believe, this is my belief system, is a wise and ancient teacher who I personify as Mother Ayahuasca. Um, I, think, I think that the plants are like antennae for ancient spiritual beings which which manifest uh, through the plants access us through the plants see mother ayahuasca she can't change the world directly because she is not a creature of matter she is a creature of pure consciousness but how can she change the world she can affect human consciousness and lead us to change the world and that's what i see happening with uh, with ayahuasca uh, today so gradually over the years Having gone from atheism and materialism, I found myself uh, deeply immersed in a spiritual universe once again. And I would say that that is the, the most important thing to me that I do. And I want to honor, I always want to honor the ancients 
for their profound understanding of spirit. By the comparison with them, we in the 21st century are infants. And that's why I also always want to remember their spiritual power and beauty and not simply to be distracted by the technological mysteries. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, that's the, that's the spiel about Graham Hancock's life. As an outsider, let's have some questions. Let's have some discussions. Uh, I'll start with you. It would be great if we can get a microphone. Thanks. Uh, when you were mentioning the ayahuasca and you said that you had contact with other entities, I just really wanted you to like go deeper in that, and I'm curious what that experience was. And just Encounters with entities. Yes, and yes. also just your ayahuasca experience, just from your perspective, like what you saw, felt... I just would love to know more okay. about that. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about that. Um, First of all, be aware that, that scientific research, with, um, particularly with DMT, but also with, uh, in ayahuasca, DMT is the active ingredient. Now, if you heard, heard my talk the other day, you'll know how it works, that the DMT is contained in the leaves of a certain plant, but the DMT is not normally orally active. We have an enzyme in our gut called monoamine oxidase that switches it off on contact. The ayahuasca vine contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. You mix it together with the leaves and you get orally active DMT, but something else. They've always believed in the Amazon that the intelligence behind the ayahuasca brew is in the vine, not in the leaves that contain the DMT. They see the force in the leaves. That's, they call it the force. That's what breaks you through. But the intelligence is in the vine. And it is the vine that has harnessed the leaves in order to access human consciousness. This is widely understood in the Amazon in this way. And the vine, we see her as Mother Ayahuasca, the spirit behind the vine. In the Amazon, not all tribes regard her as she. There are a number of tribes who regard the spirit of Ayahuasca as male. In the experience of the contact with this particular entity, she, and I persist in calling her she, can take many different forms. She might be a jaguar, not the car, but the huge, powerful Amazonian jungle cat. Uh, she might be an enormous boa constrictor. She might be a beautiful human woman with ra radiating just awesome power. You know, I understood what the ancient Egyptians meant about the goddess Isis when I met Mother Ayahuasca in these visions. I, I understood, maybe it's just my imagination. We can't prove any of this. But I understood I was dealing with a goddess. Uh, the goddess of our planet, who nevertheless somehow has time for us as individuals. I mentioned the scientific research because the scientific research that's been done shows that these commonalities in experience with ayahuasca and DMT are actually universal. They're found all around the world and, and people keep reporting meeting entities who communicate with them, of whom the most powerful is, is Mother Ayahuasca. Now, there are many other entities. You see, the thing is, this is, this is the thing. And again, bear in mind, I, I, could, I might not be right. I'm just giving you my view. What ayahuasca does is it lowers our psychic shields. It brings them right down. And then the entities of that realm can gain access to us, of whom the guiding entity is, is Mother Ayahuasca. And her mission, I am absolutely certain, is love. It's about love. It's about teaching humanity to love and not to fear, and teaching us to nourish and embrace this, this beautiful planet. But unfortunately, in the realm where she exists, which um, is a non-physical realm, there are other entities too. And those other entities do not have human interests at heart. And they see an opportunity with the shields down to dive in. And that's why, that's why an excellent shaman who has no ego is really important. A shaman who's only there to serve the vine and to assist and help and to pr protect and control the space. I've, I've seen terrifying things happen during ayahuasca sessions. Um, I have myself and, and Santa have come under attack during ayahuasca sessions. There are certain people, you have to watch out for this, there's going to be more problems. I've, I've now come across two of these individuals who ruthlessly go around ayahuasca groups, joining them, pretending to be part of the fun, but they're there for psychic 
vampirism purposes entirely. Uh, they, 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 are, they are drawing energy from other, from other participants. They, they say that they're there to be part of this loving group. No, they're not. They're there to drain out other people's psychic energy. Santa was made ill for more than a year with shingles as a result of such an attack, which the shaman in that case was not able to protect again. Believe me, these strange experiences for me have become very, very real. I, have, I will not share it here, but I have been given a piece of information concerning a member of my family which neither he nor I knew anything about. A year later, that information turned out to be 100% true. Um, I've had a number of inexplicable paranormal experiences with, with ayahuasca. And amongst those is the experience of encounters with entities. One of them, who I meet more on smoke DMT than ayahuasca, I call the trickster. Um, and he appears like a magician. He's very tall and thin, and he keeps making these motions with his hands as though he's stretching out wires. And somehow I feel that there's a, there's a message in the hand motions, and, I, and he scares me. I don't know why. Uh, the, other, the other regular encounter is with the entity I construe as Mother Ayahuasca. And uh, she, she took a direct personal interest in my cannabis habits, which was interesting and stopped me, as I say, smoking cannabis for three years, which was really what I needed at the time. I, I needed that more than anything else. And it was just such a gift uh, to me. <laughs> it's strange, you know. Recently, she, she doesn't seem to like certain medications. Re, uh, uh, for a long time, I told you I had migraines. I used to take uh, terrible overdoses of the medicine you call acetaminophen here which is Tylenol. I mean, uh, we call it paracetamol in the UK. It's a very bad medicine. It really screws up your liver. And um, uh, especially when you take it, as I did, eight tablets a day, every day, for years and years and years. So I'm in an ayahuasca session last year, in 2014, actually in, here in California. And, and uh, Mother Ayahuasca appears to me, and she shows me the packet of paracetamol. And the message is, you take any more of these, you're going to kill yourself. Yeah? <laughs> That's the fact. I came out of that session. No way on earth am I ever going to take any more acetaminophen. And, and amazingly, since then, my, my headaches have, have reduced substantially. I still get them, but they've, they've, I, I just don't take painkillers anymore. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, I feel I'm dealing with a, with a real intelligence. And I think we have to, I think in order to get to grips with this, we simply have to broaden our concept of reality. Um, that we aren't just the material stuff in which we are incarnated, that we are, we are something more and beyond that. And, and the opportunity to make, make contact with that is a powerful one. The, the point I would make is that although we are dealing with powerful entities of consciousness, we always do still have choice. You know, we can always say, no, I, I, you know, that, that bad influence is I don't want you, go away. And we can, say, we can say yes to what's good and no to what's bad. The choice is always there. It seems that good and evil operate in this realm and they operate in other realms too, in, in one way or another. Yes. Um, yes, you, you there, and then I'll go to the other side of the room and let's, let's carry on. Yes, I, I would appreciate if, if you feel moved and appropriate to tell us about an experience that Bob Laval mentioned that you had, which is, as I, if I understand what he said, um, you had an experience, I believe, in a dream state, maybe ayahuasca, of the Egyptian Hall of Judgment. Mm. Yes, I did, um, to some extent. Uh, that, that experience was um, amongst the five sessions that I had in October 2011 that stopped me smoking cannabis. Um, I was shown very clearly the way that my words, my actions, were hurting other people. And that I had become incredibly selfish and self-absorbed and, and arrogant. I was shown this very, very, very clearly. And I realized that I was in a place that was very like the place that the ancient Egyptians called the Hall of Mart. Hall of the Double Marty, the, the Judgment Hall of Osiris, as a matter of fact. At one end of it sits Osiris in his throne, and at the other end 